Lord, as we look into your word, send your Holy Spirit among us to open our eyes and open our hearts, that we might receive what you have for us and understand it in the context of our lives and our time and our setting, that our lives might glorify you, that we might serve you and serve one another, and that we might find joy in these things. In Jesus' name, amen. So we've been walking through Colossians, and this week, as we near the end of this letter from Paul to an early, uh, early Christian community, we kind of get down to some, some of the nitty-gritty, the, the, the details of how this plays out in day-to-day -day life. Uh, he's, he's painted this picture of, uh, I thought that's a beautiful picture, really, uh, but, a, but in some ways a very high-level picture of uh, what it means to be followers of Jesus and what God has done for us and what it means that, that Jesus is true God as well as true man, that, that, he, that he's God himself who took on flesh and, and, and walked this earth and died on a cross and, and won this salvation for us. And we've talked about baptism and the new life that we're given and, and how this is true and a kind of... We've been talking on a theological level, I'll say. Um, but, but this week, as he, as, he gets, as he sort of unpacked all of that, now he, he moves into some real nuts and bolts of day-to-day -day life. And he's got three different relationships that he wants us to look at because through these, if we can understand how these relationships work, I think he sort of uses them in a, in a way that says if you know how these work and if you understand what it means to be a Christian and what it means for Jesus to be guiding you in these places, then you're going to be able to figure out so many other things as well. You're going to be able to figure out your place in so many other relationships. And so, so we're going to spend time just kind of walking through. But I want us to understand that, um, that Paul was definitely in a different cultural setting. Uh, so translating to our time and place requires a little bit of understanding of, of how things worked in his time and what maybe he didn't need to explain as well as what he did need to explain. And then, and then sort of taking, okay, what was he teaching for people living in that time and place? And when we bring it here into San Lorenzo and in our, into our lives and in the real people that we interact with, how does it play out for us? What, what truth do we, do we pull forward and, and figure out how did, that, how did that play out here in my life and in my world? And so the first of these three relationships that, that Paul teaches us about and talks about is marriage. It's a relationship between husbands and wives. So our reading today starts off in Colossians 3, verse 18. It says, Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Submit is not a word that plays well in our cultural setting. <laughs> um, it's got all kinds of negative connotations and, and for very good reason, honestly. I think verses like this have been used by... Um, have been used by people wearing the label Christian, and, and they've been used in ways that really aren't helpful. Um, and it's, it's painted a bad picture, and it's left a bad taste in people's mouths. Um, and some have taken advantage of a language like this to support a position that's really not helpful, and that's really not loving. Now, Paul didn't have to counter that because, because the, and I don't get into the grief and all that kind of stuff, but, but the language he's using wasn't, wasn't going to raise a whole bunch of red flags for his original readers because there weren't all these negative connotations. You know, the, the ESV and other translations try really hard to find the right word that, that corresponds to the Greek and submit linguistically correspond, but culturally doesn't. <laughs> um, and so that's the difficulty. We plug in a different word that sounds right culturally, um, then you know, people will argue that well, linguistically that's not really what the Greek word means. And so it, it's kind of a tricky space for that. But if you just think about this, um, and the idea of what Paul is saying, what is, what is he countering against? Well, what would be the opposite of submit? Think about it. The, the opposite of submit is, is not work together. Actually, the opposite of submit would be to rebel against or to defy. And, and that's more what Paul is getting at. He's not trying to tear down equality or, um, or mutual support within a marriage relationship. He's, he's really trying to point out, you know, don't work against. <laughs> um, and don't try to tear the other down. Um, and don't try to, um, to demean. See, the negative connotations that our, our culture carries with submit in this context, it, it gets in the way of us understanding. Because too often when we hear submit, we... 
Um, we infer that this means to be inferior to, that it means to be lesser. Um, but that, that negative view wasn't really present for Paul's original readers. And so maybe for us, in some ways, maybe a better word or a better way to understand this is simply stand with. You know, to stand with your, your partner in marriage, to, to partner with them, to support um, that, that husband, that wife. Maybe we could use the word honor, to honor your husband. In fact, that's the word that's used in the traditional marriage vows, isn't it? To love, honor, and cherish. It works, works pretty well. And actually that vow sort of moves us into that, that next verse, where it says, husbands, love your wives. Because that's in that vow too, isn't it? To love your wives. And the verb there in the, in the Greek is agape, which I'm sure many of you have heard, that unconditional love. So husbands, love unconditional. Love without strings. Love even when it's hard. Love even when it hurts. Love no matter the cost. That's the, that's the calling within that, that relationship. And then Paul, Paul moves on to another relationship. And he talks about children. He says, children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Isn't it interesting how children are called to, to obey their parents? And then you kind of expect that you're going to hear something about parents, but instead you hear fathers. Maybe because us dads need this pointed out to us a little more. I don't think it's meant to exclude moms, okay? Uh, that's, that's not the point here. Um, but, but maybe it needed to be personalized for some dads. Um, maybe we needed to be reminded about our role and our relationship with our kids. And I think if we want to understand the, the parent relationship to children, children's relationship to their parents, I think, I think, I think we can lean on a word that I introduced in that last set of relationships as well. I think honor fits really well. I think there's something being said here about children, how children honor their parents, and I think there's something equally being said about how parents honor their children. Because honor gives value. Honor, honor says this other person is worth something. And the way that I interact, the way that I treat them, or the way I posture myself toward them, within my role even, indicates whether or not I am valuing them. It doesn't say that you know, parents refrain from disciplining or, or educating or, uh, or teaching children. All of those are important in the context of honoring them. And certainly, children are to, are to obey their parents. But their obedience doesn't, doesn't come just because the parent is the parent and therefore they're right every single time, no matter even if they're wrong. <laughs> Children are called to obey out of honor for their parents. Wives honor husbands. Husbands honor wives. And now children honor parents, and parents honor children. And then we read on, we see bond servants obey in everything. Those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service, as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ, for the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. So this is another difficult relationship for us to get our heads around. Uh, in many translations, instead of at the beginning there, instead of bond servants, you're going to see slaves. Um, the the ESV, what we're reading from this morning, English Standard Version, I think, uh, very very specifically chooses bond servant because it, the translators want to help us disconnect uh, slavery in the Roman world from our understanding of slavery uh, in the American context because because they were quite a bit different. Um, I guess one, uh, our, our American, in our American context, in our history, uh, slavery was extremely demeaning, and it was, um, it was racially defined. So think about this. From what you know from history in, in, our, in our context, um, if a slave were to run away um, and to escape from a harsh master, uh, those kind of things, how easy would it be for a slave to blend in with the surrounding society 
um, and, and make their way in a, in a new life? Well, probably not easy at all. Because slavery in the United States was very much defined by skin color. You couldn't blend into a segregated society and find a place because when everyone who looks like you is a slave, uh, there's, there's no place else for you to end up, in a sense. It's very hard to not get caught and get returned to your previous life. In the Roman world, uh, skin color, language, ethnic background, those weren't, uh, those weren't the things that defined slavery. Now, certainly there were, there were different people groups that had been conquered or this or that had happened and that contributed to where they ended up in terms of uh, class, if you will. Um, but there was such a mix of people and so many of them looked and sounded and dressed alike <laughs> um, that you could tell who had more money than whom. But it wasn't so simple to tell who was a boxer and who was not all the time. That's just one lens through which we can consider the differences maybe in, in Roman slavery and the, the ugliness of slavery in our country. It's, it's also helpful to note that, um, that this was another relationship in the home. And actually that's why I find this context here as Paul's writing this letter. He talks about husbands and wives. He talks about parents and children. And now he talks about um, bond servants or slaves because it was pretty common. It, it wasn't just the elite who had household servants. It was fairly common for families to have servants who lived in the same house with them um, and shared space and shared caretaking of the home and shared sort of the responsibilities of making family life work and making home life work. So they shared rooms and they shared food and they shared chores and they, um, they traveled through the ups and downs, so to say, of family life together, almost, almost as extended families in some cases. And that's not to say that, that slavery of any form is good. Uh, far from it. But, but one of the, one of the countercultural practices in the early church that really stood out for people, because as much as, as, much as the, the system of slavery wasn't, doesn't match up one for one with, with our, our history in our country, um, it, was still, it was still part of a class system that saw some people as having status higher and some people having status lower. Um, and those Roman citizens, you know, were, were kind of top of, the, top of the system, if you will, and then certain positions in, in government and certain positions of authority. But then those other ethnic groups and those other language groups and those other, other jobs that were done. Uh, and the, the slaves were, were down on the bottom rung. In those classes. And one of the things that was so eye-catching and that was so different among the Christians in this context and in this world was that it didn't matter what class you were from, it didn't matter if you were a slave or a master, it didn't matter how much money you had or didn't have, you were on equal footing within the church because your brothers and sisters were the people sitting next to you. And it didn't matter if you were coming from different places because before your God, you had the same need and before your God, you received the same gifts. And so you were treated as equals. And you were, and, and even you see Paul bringing this out in First Corinthians because they messed it up, right? And in practice of the Lord's Supper, they had, oh, those people with the better status were, were closer to the table and, and kind of in the inner circle, and then some other people sat in the back of the room, and they got some leftovers. And he said, that's not the way it is. That's not how God's people act. That's how the rest of the world acts. But you are different. And so that's that's part of what what Paul is bringing out here. Is no, you, you treat one another differently because Christ has treated you differently. Placing these different classes on equal footing before God and, and claiming one another as full brothers and sisters in Christ was, was mind-blowing to the outside world. And so maybe, maybe that helps a little bit because I think the best way we can reframe and we can sort of draw in, what is Paul saying to us? Because obviously we don't, we don't have slaves. Well, that's, that's an ugly word. That's a, that's a terrible thing. Um, but we do, have, we do have supervisors. We have managers. We have employers, some of us are employees. Uh, we, we still have classes of a sort. We see certain positions, certain people as more important or less important. And I think he is speaking to that. And I think he's telling us something about that. And, and, he's, and, he is, and he's not drawing us out of this world that we live in and saying, oh, actually, all, none of that actually exists, because it does actually exist. And somehow we have to navigate that. 
And there are people who have more resources than me, and there are people who have less resources than me. And there are people that I might have authority over, and there are people who have authority over me. And somehow I have to live in this real world. I can't pretend that those things aren't here. So once again, I'm going to suggest that maybe this has to do with honor. So workers, honor those who employ you and who give you work to do. And supervisors, employers, honor those who labor at your direction. See, Paul doesn't tear apart every relationship. He says the relationship isn't there. He says, no, the relationship's there. So how do you honor the other person in that relationship? In some cases, that might mean some drastic changes. In other relationships, it might mean some constant adjustments. But how do I honor that other person? He says, he points that out in his context for, for slaves, for bond servants. And then that last verse in our reading, Masters, treat your bond servants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. So he points that out on both sides of the relationship. And we're reminded once again that honor gives value. Honor, honor gives value to that other person. So honor the other in all of these relationships and in all of our relationships. So Paul breaks it down that way. He gives us these three which are really centered in the home. So these relationships in the household context, husbands and wives honor one another. Parents and children honor one another. Employers, employees honor one another. They're three very different relationships. I mean, we get that right away, right? I don't, I don't love my boss the same way I love my wife. No. <laughs> So I don't honor them in the same ways, but I give both honor. You know, we're not, you're not called to love your children in the same way that you love your spouse, but you are, are called to love both, and you're called to honor both. And people reading Paul's letter for the first time, they got that too. They, they understood these aren't all the same relationship, and that's why he gives us more than one. He doesn't want us to get tunnel vision and think, oh, this is how it always works, because in our different relationships, it plays out a little bit differently. But there's a still a call that's the same across the board of honoring the other. All three of these relationships were steeped with in cultural expectations, local norms, practices, real life experience, just like our relationships are too. I mean, our relationships are, to some extent, defined by the world around us. And our picture, and, and other people's picture of how these things work, is shaped by that. Not all of that is bad. But how do we honor one another within that? Because what that means is none of these relationships is theoretical. You know, we're not imagining, you know, what it's going to be like if one day I have the relationship of having a mom or a dad. Or if I have the relationship of, of working for somebody or supervising employees or having a spouse. These are the real places where, where people live in their day-to-day in their -day lives. It's, it's not stepping back and saying, oh, what if? It's, it's, it's looking into the world and saying, okay, this is where we're at. How do we navigate? How do we do this now? Because we're here. But Jesus has changed me. He's changed my outlook on, on what else is here and who else is here. So how do, I, how do I live this out? So we have to ask ourselves the question, how do I honor the other? In our marriages, husbands and wives, how do you honor the other? If you're single, how do you honor marriage? And if you're married, how do you, how do you honor those who are single? Because we have relationships there with real people as well. As a child, what does it mean to honor your parents? And as a parent, what does it really mean to honor your child? And then in work, the back and forth, how do we honor the other? I want you to think about it a little bit in this way. We give attention. We give status. We give dignity to other people by the way that we interact with them, by the way that we treat them. And we desire, definitely, to some extent, in appropriate ways, we, attention, like we, we, we desire attention and status and dignity for ourselves. And so we can, we can maybe think about that in terms of how do we honor, how do we value the people around us? 
In every relationship that we've talked about, there's the there's the one, right? Whether that's the parent or the employer or the the spouse. And there's the other, because there's two sides to every relationship. And here's our tendency as individuals. Um, husbands sometimes want maybe a little more attention. So their desire is to try to build themselves up in some way, to add a little something in. Wives, at the same time, when they realize their husband has set themselves up a little bit higher, they have a desire for some dignity. So they try to add something in as well. And we have this back and forth. Or, or maybe it's like this. Back this up. What do children do? Children rebel sometimes. I think, I think some of that is a desire for more status. To try to add something in there to the relationship for themselves. To place themselves up a little bit higher. And, and when, when children do that, parents feel like maybe their, their status is, is in jeopardy. So what do they do? Sometimes they do things that take away the dignity of the other. They devalue. Employers sometimes do that as well. Employees lose dignity by the ways that they're treated by a, by a system or by a person. And when that happens to employees, what, what do they do back to the employer? Well, they don't really give much attention. So they take away the attention their employer might desire on tasks or, or people or outcomes. But what if, what if, what if we honor the other? This idea of tension, and status, and dignity. What if in these relationships and so many others, we, we seek to, to honor the other? Well, I think honor gives value. I think honor gives value which elevates the other. And so when, maybe if we have husbands and wives, when we think about that relationship, when, when wives come alongside their husbands, what are they really doing? They're giving attention to their husband. And, and when husbands love their wives, what are they doing? I think they're giving status to their wives by the way that they treat them, the way they honor them. And, and one honors the other, not adding to themselves and not taking away from the other, but building the other up. And when, when we have children and parents, I need to reset. <laughs> When children do obey their parents, they give their parents status, right? They, they give their, their parents the, the, the position, if you will, in that relationship that, that they're, that's due them. That, that makes sense. And, and they, they honor their parents in that way and they build up their parents. And, and what does it say in the, in the text? When, uh, when parents do not provoke, fathers do not provoke your children, right? What does that do? Giving dignity. It's giving dignity to, your, dignity to your children and building them up. And so one honors the other once again. And we can do this with each, each relationship and we can see how they, you know, one builds the other up. And we can understand how, how <coughs> honor gives value to the other, which, which elevates the other. It doesn't elevate myself and it doesn't tear the other down. It, it, it elevates and it honors and it gives value like that. And so this is what you do. This is what Paul is saying. At the end of this letter, as he's explained what Christ has done for us and who you are in Christ, 
And all that that means, he makes it really practical. He says, here's some relationships that we can talk about. And here's what it means in those relationships. It means that you honor people. It means that you give this to one another. And he's saying this, let all of your relationships, these that, that I give you as examples and, and everything else that spills out of there, let all of your relationships reflect the relationship that you have with Christ. You give attention, status, and dignity. You give these to others because Christ has given this to you. Because he's, he's given you attention and status and dignity as well. And, and think about all three of these relationships, right? All three that he, that he lays out here at the end of the book. Husbands and wives, marriage, right? Well, is there, is there a link to your relationship with, with Christ? Yeah. He's the bridegroom of the church, and you are his bride as the church. And so this picture of husbands and wives, when husbands and wives get it right, and when one, one honors the other, there's a picture there, and there's a glimpse that the rest of us get when we see a marriage that's working, we see somebody, somebody honoring their spouse, we get a little bit of a picture of what our relationship with Christ is supposed to be like. Because we are, we are the bride of Christ. And so we have a relationship that's something like that. And, and children and parents, when, when that relationship plays out and, and children honor parents and parents honor their children, well, I just ask up here at the children's message, God is your heavenly father, right? And you are his beloved children. You are sons and daughters of the king. And when we see parents and children living out this, this relationship where one honors the other, what we're seeing is we're seeing a glimpse of what God has called us to. Because our Father has, has honored you as his children. And he's invited you and called you to honor him. To give his attention and dignity and status. To give these things to, to him because he's given that to you. And even that last one, right? Because you were slaves to sin. But now, you've been made servants of Christ. And so even that relationship, even as we serve one another, in those, in those settings where there is a, a master, or a supervisor, in today's language, or an employer, and an employee, even, even when someone has authority over you, or you have authority over another, guess what? That too, when it plays out correctly, when it plays out in a healthy way, when honor is given from one to the other, that gives us a glimpse as well as God's people. Of, this is what God's relationship with us is called to be as well. Because he, again, gives that honor to us. We give that honor to him. And that's, that's the model for us in all of these relationships. And that's what we see over and over. And actually... It's even better than that. Because when we understand our relationship with Christ and what it means for each of us, you see here. his attention to you as his people. Even when he came into a world that we're told ignored him. A world that didn't recognize him. A world that didn't seem to want him. He gave his attention fully to you and I. Oh. I've mixed up. He gave his status he gave up being God in heaven, sitting on his throne, and being separate from this world. And he entered this world, and he became a human being. But not only that, he became a child. He had to be cared for. The creator had to be cared for by his creatures. He gave up that for you. And in so doing, he gave up his dignity. He gave up who he was as God, he gave up his dignity on the cross as he suffered and as he died and as he was ridiculed and as he was mocked to take your place and to give honor to you and to give you all of these gifts. This is the picture of what your God has done for you. So the calling that you and I have in each of our relationships is to follow his lead. Is to follow his lead and and to know that we, 
We have all of this given to us by His work, by His gifts, and by His grace. Jesus has honored you. He's given you value that elevates you. And now He asks you, and He calls you, to honor those in your life, to elevate them, to show them, and to give them value as well. So go and do this. Go and do this as the people of God. Go and do this as, as those who've been built up in Him. Go and do this as the sons and daughters of the King. Go and do this as those who've been honored by Christ. Amen. I invite you to, to sing. Uh, we're going to sing a...